All right. Okay. Thank you for coming along. I'm, I'm going to give a the, the main thing I'll be doing today, of course, is giving a bit of a workshop on Minsky, how to use it. And has anybody actually downloaded Minsky yet? And who has actually used it? Let's see. A few. Okay. Uh, if you haven't downloaded it yet, then of course it's open source, so it's free, and the source code is also available uh, from the website. But if you go to that that website, sourceforge dot net slash project slash Minsky. So if you haven't actually downloaded it yet, can you do that now? If you, you should all have access to Edge RAM on you. Who has Minsky installed right now? Quite a few. Okay. Who hasn't? A few couple of minutes. So just go to that location and I'll talk a bit of I'm giving a bit of background first of all, so while I'm doing that just you know take a look and those that haven't got it downloaded and install it. Um, if you're running a Windows program, probably also if you're running Mac, I don't, I don't use Mac so I don't know, but if you're running it, it'll give you this warning saying this is dangerous software. Well, that's true. Uh, <laughs> ignore the warning and there, there's another thing to say, more info. Click on more info, click on option, run anyway. Okay, So run anyway, then you install it and it'll all work quite, quite smoothly. So do that. Um, and also, who, has anybody here got a copy of the beta, the beta software? We have two versions. We have, a, we have a development version we just call Minsky, and there's under the same subdirectories, there's another thing which says all files. There's another version called Minsky Beta, and that's where we uh, have latest development. There's a, there's a major change in the software between the development version and the beta. It's been called, what, what's been done is what's called a refactoring. And uh, is anybody here a computer programmer? Anybody? Yo, okay. Well, you know, you start off with an idea, you build it, you get to a certain point, holy shit, why didn't I define things that way back there? So you go back and you redefine everything. So <coughs> with Minsky, we first of all defined it to give us a canvas on which you draw dynamic systems. And then we started to, to add grouping in later. What they meant, every time you added a new object, like for example, a, a graph, you needed to define it that it had the capability to be grouped. And became incredibly messy. So Russell just got the programmer just got sick of all that stuff. He said, "I'm going to go back and redefine the whole code so everything starts as a group, and then a group can contain groups, and then bang, that solved all those problems." It's actually halved the amount of code. So the amount of code in terms of lines of C++ code, which is what Minsky's written in, it's gone from about 25,000 lines to 12,500. Okay, so half the amount of code, increased the amount of features. So that's the advantage of. So this, this is a SourceForge page. If you go there, you'll, you'll find it. And normally you just click on, if you're running Windows, you just click on download and that'll give you the latest version. It also says browse all files at this point. If you browse all files, you get the, um, the beta version as, as possibility as well. Now, one thing which um, I, I found in, in using Minsky, um, I first discovered system dynamic software in 1989 or 1990. And I purchased a copy of what I regard as the best program at the time for three and a half thousand US dollars when I was doing my PhD. Um, and I really didn't know how to use it in the intuitive sense, which is design, but I really learned a lot from that particular software package. But what I've realized is economists are com virtually completely ignorant of the whole approach of system dynamics. Who had heard of system dynamics before you saw Minsky? A couple, okay? So most of you, Minsky was the first time you con confronted a system dynamics program. That's common. And uh, so I'm going to have a bit of a dig at it. The guy's become a bit of a friend on the internet these days, Noah Smith. Uh, he, he really had a go at me when he, the first thing he published on me was called Keen Attempts at Coup. Um, and then one day I suddenly see this post about him writing on the absurdity of my new Minsky tool. So I, we enjoyed a little typical little. Uh, Twitter joust began at that point, and I'm saying calling any of these things uh, absurd is, you know, you're in for a fight, and, uh, you know, they start fighting. And the first thing he says, okay, before I fight, tell me what the wires do. Now, at that point, I realised he wasn't attacking Minsky, he was attacking the whole concept of system dynamics without knowing he was doing it. Okay. And I wrote to him and said, look, we should have a conversation offline. I, he wrote back and he, he followed me so we could have that. I didn't see that, my mistake been in a pretty obstreperous conversation on Twitter for a while. We've ended on a friendly note. He apologised for getting peeved. And he's now written to me since then offline as well and said, look, I'm really sorry why I treated you early on, but that's 
let's get together and, and we're going to get up and when I go to the States again, have dinner together. Um, so it's, it's been one of those positive, Twitter has led to a friendship rather than animosity. Okay. But what I realised, it isn't just uh, neoclassicals who don't know system dynamics. Most of us don't know it. So this is a quote, and I won't say who it's from, but he's a close friend, fellow post-Keynesian, and over a meal one day said, why is Minsky so hard to use? Well, one of the fundamental reasons is because you bastards haven't learned system dynamics before. It's a foreign modelling. It's as if you'd never use spreadsheets. And then somebody says, here's a spreadsheet. We'll do some calculations for me. You go, what? What's a spreadsheet? How do I type equations? Where are the equations? So it's the same unfamiliarity. And it, it's a common thing. And the intriguing thing is the people who invented this, uh, who's, who's seen The Limits to Growth? The book, The Limits to Growth, okay. Jay Forrester invented the software package that Limits to Growth was written in. It was written by somebody else. His first one was called Simple, which stands for simulation uh, of, of uh, using lots of equations. Simulation of processes and using lots of equations. Then there was Dynamo, and I think that's what uh, World, the World 3 model was written in. And then out of that evolved the whole software industry uh, where you build equations using flowcharts. Now engineers, if you do an engineering degree, anybody done engineering here? Okay, nobody engineering. You learn MATLAB, you've heard of MATLAB. Who's got a copy of MATLAB? Okay. Have you ever looked at Simulink? MATLAB comes with a package called Simulink, which is a flowchart software package. So this has been going on for half a century. And that's how far behind economics education is because when uh, the people who did Limits to Growth did it, they expected economists to say, fantastic, here's a brilliant way of doing dynamic modelling, we can throw away those sheets of papers and drop the equilibrium assumptions and be much more dynamic. Instead, they got disparaged and ridiculed and rubbished by economists. And the whole concept of Limits to Growth was disparaged without looking at the underlying concept about modelling feedbacks, which is what these systems are designed to do. So MATLAB is the dominant program because I didn't invent the wires. No one thought I invented the ideas of wires. No, I didn't. I was taking something which was at that stage when I copied it was about, I don't know, the first package came out. It's about 50, about 49 years old, the concept of using wires to draw up equations. First done in, uh, in, the, in, in, uh, in, in Simple. So now you've got MATLAB, which charges $2,000 a copy for the package. Mathematica has Smodeler, which is a recent program. Vensim is popular in, in marketing and management applications. I don't particularly like its interface. Vizsim is my favourite, uh, and a lot of the ideas I've, I've borrowed from those various equations. But what you're doing is you're using a flowchart to give a causal statement of a system of equations. And what the wires do is they assign values. They're sort of like equal signs, but they also are used to say, if you want to multiply two things together, you wire them up to a multiplier by a sign and then if you attach the multiply by a sign to another variable, you're saying this variable is those two model variables multiplied together. So this is a little, I'll take you through building this one um, in Minsky as we go through a demo, once everybody's got a copy installed. Um, so that's how Minsky does this particular model. I know it's very hard to see on that screen there. This is how the same thing is done in, in, ben, in, uh, in Bensim. So this thing says, GDP divided by labour productivity gives you how many workers are employed and if you divide workers by population get the employment rate. And that's this little bit here of Minsky. Okay. Output divided by productivity gives you employment, divided by population you get the employment rate. And as a set of equations, that's what you get. Employment is output divided by labour productivity and the employment rate is employment divided by population. So it's just an alternative. This is a, a flowchart alternative to defining a set of equations. Now, offhand, I'll just take, so you've got here employment is equal to output divided by productivity. The employment rate is employment divided by population. Investment is equal to profits. And this is the simple Goodwin model that all investments, all profits are invested. Output is capital divided by capital output ratio. Profits is output minus wages. The wage bill is the wage rate times employment. The rate of change of wages is a Phillips curve times a gap between the employment rate and Nehru. Uh, and the rate of change of capital is indicative of investment. So that, that's done as a set of equations. Here's exactly the same thing here as a flowchart. Output divided by productivity gives you employment. 
Employment divided by population gives you the employment rate. Employment rate minus Nauru gives you the gap between where wages don't change and whether they go up or down, given the current rate. Multiply by the flow for the Phillips curve. Multiply that by the wage. Integrate it, you get the wage. Multiply the wage by the employment rate, you get the wage bill. Subtract wage bill from output, you get profit. All profits are invested in this simple model. Uh, investment integrated gives you capital stock. Capital stock divided by capital output ratio gives you an output. Which, which of those two approaches, and be quite honest, is easier to understand? The set of equations or the flow chart? It depends on the audience for me, the, the, the set of equations. Set of equations. We used to see the set. Pardon? We used to see the equation and yeah. they look easier just for beginning. Yeah. I want to have both yeah. approaches. I think sometimes the flow chart, when I'm explaining the first year students, the flow chart makes plenty of sense to them. Oh yeah, this causes that, causes that. And you see a causal loop. And that's really the important thing about system dynamics. It's a causal loop that leads back on itself. You don't need ceteris paribus. Okay? You have causes going through rates of change to come back and give you the cause again. So it shows it's a closed system. Yeah? When you said before engineers all discipline system dynamics, isn't that kind of new? Why didn't you try out other simulation software? Or what is the unique thing about Minsky compared to other systems? Yeah, uh, the, main, the main reason was that the only package I would maybe wanted to, like most, most people who work in economics who use system dynamics use a package called Vensim. And I regarded it as having the clunkiest interface. That, to me, that was a bit like adding a, a V12 engine to a Prada. Okay. I'd rather put the V12 in a new engine. So I didn't like Vensim. I did like VizSim, and I was willing, I actually negotiated with the people who write VizSim to add what Minsky adds, which is unique to their program. Um, but when I applied for funding from INET, I gave them three options. One is that I, uh, for, for, for 125,000 US dollars, I would get a, um, a uh, notebook written in Mathematica. And then you need to have Mathematica to run the tables. For 190,000, I'd get a table added to Vince to Vizsim. For a quarter of a million, I'd write it in C++. They gave me 125,000 and said write it in C++. <laughs> okay. They didn't even realise they, they said, the mother said, it's been complete. They said, you gave me half the, half the bloody money I needed. So I had to raise the rest through a Kickstarter campaign. But that's, that's the short answer. The other is I did some things with Minsky that were better than the other programs because I spent 15 years as a software reviewer for Australian computing magazines. And I saw hundreds of computer programs and it, I pulled in all sorts of ideas from Minsky that weren't in any other programs, and I'll show you that. So the main thing is it's got some better features, but it would be better, I agree, to have one bit cool to put them all into. Okay, so the, the, the thing which makes Minsky unique, in other words, there's lots of programs you could do what I'm going to show you with, apart from Minsky. What, what you can't do with those programs other than Minsky is model financial dynamics easily. So I'll show you that at the end. Now, it's written not by me, I, I'm designing it, I'm the architect and the builder is Russell Standish. But Russell has a PhD in physics, and he's focused on complex systems. So he built an evolutionary model called Ecolab, which you can also download from SourceForge. And that's a bit like, if you, you're getting, um, Magda was talking about Swarm yesterday, um, for multi-agent modelling, for those who did that course, Ecolab does the same sort of thing. Okay. And a lot of what's in Minsky is built on the Ecolab Foundation. And Russell also ran the High Performance Computing Unit at the University of New South Wales. And then, in a typical save money rationalisation, they shut it down. Which meant he had to go as a freelance programmer. Which is bad news for him, but it was good news for me because I could hire him to, get, to write Minsky. But of course, for him to write Minsky, I've got to pay him. So, Minsky's been developed very, very slowly because I only very slowly got money to develop it. I've really had two major sources of funding. One that roughly 125,000 US dollars from INET, then I raised 78,000 on Kickstarter and some side money as well that pretty much doubled that. And then I've got a 20,000 pound grant from Kingston to make it more user-friendly for students. That's it. So total developments below 
300,000 US, which is trivial when you compare to packages like MATLAB itself, Microsoft Word, they've had hundreds of millions of dollars of development time. So there's lots of weaknesses in the program, but their weakness is because you simply haven't had enough time to develop it so far. So I want to raise more money to continue developing it. Now, let's bring it up. So who's got a copy of Minsky running? Got it running now? Okay. Okay. So what you get, obviously the usual menu up the top here. There is no ribbon. You'll notice that. There is never going to be a ribbon. You know the ribbon they've got in Microsoft Word? I think it's a cruddy piece of info, so I'm not going to design that into Minsky. But so you have this file, open a system. Um, I'm not sure how the library works. So that might be a new feature. Uh, output LaTeX, so you can output the equations, and I'll show you that in a, in a moment, uh, to other software packages and so on. Uh, you can insert objects from a menu here if you want to. Um, this controls things like background colour, so if I wanted to make the background colour a different colour, then I could do that there. Um, and then this is to run a simulation to stop it and to do it step by step. This changes the simulation speed, and this zooms in and zooms out on a design, and this brings you back to the original scale. This is the, the operating section here where you have um, a palette. If you click on any of those objects, you can then drag them down onto the canvas. If I click, for example, on the add key, then I've got a plus key that gets attached to my mouse. And I click again, it stays on the canvas. Let's just make it a bit larger so you can see it. And if you want to move an object around, each time I make it larger, you can see it's going to go off screen. If I hold the shift key down and drag, then I move the whole palette. Okay? So that's the easiest side about it. Now, what you normally do in most of these programs, you click on something in the palette, so a variable. So I'll call this Fred and give it a value of, say, 10. God knows why I do this, but I use the Flintstones as my um, way of showing an initial equation. So here's Fred. Notice there are two big circles. That's because Fred is a variable. And a variable has, can output values to other variables and take inputs from other variables. So there's an input node here, an output node there. If you click in the, away from the circles, you physically move it around the canvas. If you click in the circle, you drag an arrow out. Okay. Now the arrow, and this is, we're still getting this right for the beta version, uh, arrow will look for the nearest possible node it can be attached to. So if you drag to a certain point and let go, the node at the plus key there is the closest, uh, and you now link to it. Now I, I could go back and do the same thing for Wilma here, but one of the innovations in Minsky, it's the only program that lets you do this, you can type directly under the canvas. If I type W-I-L-M-A and press the enter key, I get Wilma. Now notice it's too small. Because I've zoomed up the rest of it, I haven't zoomed Wilma. That's a bug. Okay? It's a bug that exists in the, the release version. Once you click, it goes to the same scale. Okay? And now if I type over here Barney and move that, I've now written an equation. Fred plus Wilma equals Barney. And if you look, you see there's an equation tab here. Click on the equation tab, you'll see that equation. So you're basically defining equations that way. It's the simplest possible way to use it. Now that's in the, um, the current version. We've got the same features in the beta version, but we've improved them a bit, and I'll show you why. Um, if I now start typing on the, let's say I start typing F here for Fred, um, that's a bit hard to see, it's amplified a bit. I now get a text input box. Now, that might seem like a step backwards, but there's a reason for that. And that is that we use, another thing about Minsky which makes it unique, uh, is we use latex commands to give you formatting and non-English characters. So every other program only supports English language characters and only supports a single line of text. We support Greek, um, ultimately Chinese, and we also support superscripting and subscripting. But to do that, you've got to use characters, which are themselves other commands sometimes. So if I wanted to have, let's have, let's have um, in the current version, if I wanted to type um, Fred, what's his name? Fred Flintstone, isn't it? Okay. If I want to type Fred uh, and then underscore Flintstone, then I can do that. 
because the character isn't um, the character you use to underscore is a is a, a, a solid underscore character that gives you a subscript. But the character for a superscript is the carrot. You know, the, on the six key, the power key. So if I type Fred, and then I try to type carrot here, I get a power key because the power key. Um, you know, when you do uh, x squared in a, a, um, a spreadsheet, you use whatever the number is, and they type the six, the carrot, the power. We use that, and we actually show you a power key, but that stuffs up typing. So over here, if I type Fred, I'll get the correct one in the background there. So Fred, and I then go carrot, curly brackets. Then when I press the enter key, I then get the program brings up the menu to define what its values are. Let's say I make it 10. Then I've now got that value sitting there. I'll just make this one a bit larger as well. So now I've got it formatted, Fred at Superscript Flintstone. Uh, let's now go for Wilma. Uh, I'll go for Wilma, let's, okay, let's go Subscript just to show you what I mean by that. Interesting, the scaling's wrong. It's another bug. They should be the same scale. So there's something going wrong with it there. You need to fix up in the code itself. And now if I type, say, divided by, that's also a mistake. Notice that scale's not correct. So I've got to show this to Russell. There's more, more bugs to fix up. Let's actually go back to the zero scale, and then I'll zoom up the whole thing. Ooh. OK. Let's try again. Yep. OK, so it's not rescaling. The beta version is not rescaling mathematical operators. This is the sort of thing <coughs> you're forever checking <coughs> when you're doing software development. So now if I type Barney, I'm going to type backslash B, lowercase b for Barney. And then A-R-N-E-Y. And let's make him super skipped. Um, and a backslash R-U-B-B. U-B-B-L-E and give it a value. I won't give it a value, it's going to be a variable determined by other variables. And notice, let's actually make that larger again. Ah. That didn't work properly. Let's give it a, I'll edit that and check it out. That should have given me that B backslash B. Ah, hang on now. My mistake. What's the, what's the Greek word for B? Beta. And the Greek word for, for, for row? Okay. Okay, so notice I've now got a, a, a Greek B and a Greek, and, a, and a Greek R in those characters as well. So let's just attach that up there. Now notice I've got values of zero for all those elements, but one thing which is automatic in the new version, notice this dot here. Okay, that's changing the value. Now it should be changing it in Barney as well. Again, that's another, let's just put a graph inside there. Click on a graph icon, drag it down and attach. Again, this is what beta software shows you, some things aren't working properly. So we've got a basic equation there, but these are issues with the, with the beta that mean things aren't working quite as well as they should. That should be showing 1.5. If I, if I simulate this, hit the run key, notice the value that's running at 1.06 is now turning up. And if I grab the, the dot and drag, then I'm changing the value as the program runs. Okay? So you can actually use this for simple arithmetic, and I know a lot of mathematicians are using it now for simulating equations for their students because they can't do it in any other program. Now another trick I'm using right now, and this is again something no other program does, I'm pressing the arrow key, the sideways arrows keys, and they change the values. So you can actually, once you're on an icon, uh, you can change the value dynamically. 
And that's the whole idea of that is I want to use this ultimately for politicians to be told, here's the model of the economy. Here are the controls where you can control you know, the level of deficit, tax rate, etc., etc. Now you do what you think is a good economic policy and see what happens to the economy. So the whole idea is to have them to control it and then see a simulation so that they can fuck up the model before they fuck up the real economy. <laughs> now, um, let's go back to this version. This is the development version which you've currently got. It has less bugs but also less features. So if I want to turn that slider thing on, I have to right-click and choose make it a slider. And this, there's lots and lots of use of the right, the right mouse button. So uh, if, you, if you're in doubt, press the right mouse button and you get a menu. And I can choose that as slider. And now I've got the slider thing here and the same basic story applies that I've shown you a moment ago. I can vary values by pressing the arrow key. It's, I can make bigger steps if I hold the control key down and press the arrow. Okay. And let's just grab a graph down there as well. Notice everything is sizing properly in the, in the, in the release version, but not sizing properly in the, in the beta. Again, that's the usual story with beta software. So that's currently running at a value of two, I think it is. I don't know what value I've given for Wilma, but I can now change the value as the program runs. Okay. So it's a useful tool just for simple mathematical operations like that. But of course, you want to do something rather more complicated than that for modeling. So we are really about defining dynamic the systems. And if you think about the types of numbers you're going to have when you're working with a scale of system, there's four basic types of numbers you're going to have. You're going to have constants, 10, 12, 37, 12, whatever else. Parameters, which are things like the population growth rate, which you might estimate as a parameter. Variables, which are changed by other variables and can feed in and out of other variables. But also integrals. That's the huge thing that makes system dynamics different. If you want to build a dynamic model, you are doing integration. Now, there's, there's a technical reason why you do integration rather than differentiation. And that is that differentiation, if you think about walking up a hill, then the hill is changing slope all the time as you're walking up it. But the area under the hill is changing much more slowly. Okay? So integration is a smoother operation. And all these programs redefine differential equation models to be in integral terms. That's, that's what's going on there. Well, let's actually use this to make something sensible now. So I'll just go File and New. And I'll take you through that basic model of a um, of uh, the Goodwin model of a of a, of a uh, um, dynamic uh, model of the economy. Now, there's also a real pain here because these you know, because the palettes here, it's really easy to accidentally tap and bring something down. So you find yourself doing like I did just a moment ago. Right click. And the operation, you get the operation of delete the operator. Well, let's start defining GDP in that same way I showed you that initial model with. So you want to have, first of all, GDP. So just click on a variable. If you've now got GDP, hit the plus key to make it a bit larger. That's GDP. Now I'm going to type labour productivity here. So if I type L. A, B, O, R, underscore, and I'm going to put this in curly brackets, P, R, O, D, just to make it obvious what we're working with. Press the enter key, and that creates a variable called labour productivity. Okay. So then you need, and this, this is simpler in the beta version, uh, but I'll show you initially in the development version, then I'll switch over, because I know there are bugs in the beta, and for demonstration, I give it a crash. So I want to edit it and say that its value, for example, is one, let's say, one, one worker per unit of output. Well, if I now press the divide by key here, look at the mouse sitting here, press the divide by key, I get a divide by operator. I then drag from where the circle is on GDP, where the circle is on labour. If I divide GDP by labour productivity, I get workers, how many workers are hired. So I type workers here, and then drag from the point. It's sometimes hard to do this. You will sometimes not get the point properly, so you move the object rather than clicking in it. It's just a case of getting used to where the circles are. 
one of the hardest things we had to do was work out how big to make the circles. If you make them too small, you can't click on the buggers. If you make them too big, you can't not click on them. Okay? So you want to be able to do both. Um, just, to, just to show you where the program came from, by the way, further back, I'll just go back a couple of slides here. Let's just zoom in. When we began, you had to actually click on one of these buttons to say whether you were going to put a wire in to move an object to pan the entire screen or to lasso a group of objects. So part of the development done is make it modeless in that sense, and the program now interprets what you're doing. So now, if I click here, it interprets me as dragging a wire out. If I click here, it interprets me as wanting to move the object. If I hold the shift key down, the cursor changes and I move the whole thing around. Okay? So those are the basic... It's modeless in that sense. It works out what you want to do from where you're doing it in the program. So I've got workers defined. I now need to divide by population. Now notice I'm typing... Can you see what population is turning up on the screen there? Okay. It, it, it will stay there until I press the enter key and it will then appear where the mouse is currently pointing. Now I need to give population a value. So same story, right click, choose edit. Let's say there's 140 million workers, for example, in an economy. And you divide by workers by population, you get the employment rate. Now here, well, I'll type out the whole word, so employment. Now I want to, just for the heck of it, subscript the word rate. So I type the, the underscore key, curly bracket, actually I hope, no I will, I will do the full thing, and then rate, close curly bracket, because with the way LaTeX works, if you use a subscript operator, then the next character is subscripted, and all the others return to the same level on the line. If you want to subscript a whole block of characters, you've got to can close them inside of curly brackets, and then it will all be subscripted. I'll press the enter key here, move that around a bit, and I've got employment underscore rate. So now let's see what's happening on the equations tab. We've now defined these sets of equations. Now what I want to do with Minsky in terms of further development is I want to um, make it possible to work in both directions. So some stuff like this, it's easy to type a whole set of definitions and then grab them when you need them. And I'll show you why that's a good idea because with a simple model like the one I showed you back here, it's got two graphs and a fairly simple flow chart of operations. I'll go back and try that on the, yeah, a bit larger. There's no clutter problem there, in other words. You know, it's pretty easy to read that flow chart. You imagine if you have a model of a Portuguese economy, for example. You want to see one? That's a model of the Portuguese economy. This is a PhD student of mine who, as a master's student in Portugal, decided to model, use Minsky to model the Portuguese economy. And I knew that that couldn't be done. He didn't know that it could be done, so he did it. Yeah. And in other words, it is a total mess to read. I don't know how he managed to do it. But what's going on here, for example, that huge web of stuff there is defining the government deficit. And the government deficit turns up in the government uh, um, table and is linked to what feeds us on spends on households, productive sector, etc., etc. Now, all this stuff is just definitions, plus some graphs, which you actually would like to be able to see, but you can't read them because they're too damn small, <laughs> but there's too much clutter. Okay? So, a major development ambition is to get another tab up here, which I might call definitions. And then things like GDP, government deficit, etc., etc. You define them on a line-by-line -line basis, and then you can simply use them over here and get rid of all this clutter. Because the whole idea of this stuff is to give you a visual way of understanding a complex system. Now, one of the problems in this area, they actually talk about having spaghetti diagrams. Can you see why? Okay. 
like if you dumped a whole lot of spaghetti on Imagine trying to read which way spaghetti strands go in a bowl of spaghetti. Okay? Now, and then imagine that bowl of spaghetti is your model of the Italian economy. Nobody's going to understand it. Okay? You want it, the whole idea is to make this visually comprehensible. So at a small scale, <coughs> I mean, <coughs> as in that model, there's no spaghetti issue because it's too small to begin with. But if you want to get to a serious model, you've got to cope with the clutter. And no program at the moment copes with the clutter apart from grouping. And I'll show you how we group in a moment. So let's get back to the unique features there. Okay. So those types of entities, haven't already demonstrated that yet. Let's take a look at that. Labour productivity. Um, I wait till I get to the, I wait till I get to the um, accelerator relationship and then we'll make that into a parameter. Actually, no, we can do this for the... Um, Phillips curve relationship is. So I've got the employment rate. Let's drag this sideways. What I want to now do is say, given the employment rate, there's some rate of employment at which workers don't demand wage rises. And I'll call that Nehru just so that I annoy the ghost of Milton Friedman. Okay. So with Nehru down here, N-A-I-R-U, there's Nehru. I want to give a value to that. Now that's currently shown as a variable. Notice it's got an input and an output. And you know, strictly speaking, it makes sense to say that rate is variable, but for the heck of it, I'll make it a parameter here. So if you right click and go to edit, notice the type, it says flow, constant, parameter, integral and stock. Integral and stock are um, the same thing. Stock really relates to what happens with the financial tables, I'll show you in a moment. But make it a parameter and give it a value of say 0 0.6. And that's saying when 60% of the population has a job, wages will remain constant. So now it turns blue, and notice now there's no, there's no input on this side because the parameter doesn't have an input, okay? But of course it has an output. So let's now put a divide by, I actually, I, want to, I have a minus key here, so you just press a minus key, and then drag from the employment rate to the top part of it, and drag from Nehru to the bottom. You've now got the gap between the current employment rate and the rate where workers demand wage rises, and that tells you whether wages are going to rise or fall. Now you want to multiply that by a slope curve. And here I'm going to use, when I, when I do um, my, my own models, I tend to use lambda for the employment rate. So what I'm going to type is lambda underscore s for saying the slope of the Phillips curve. So you type the backslash key, L-A-M-B-G-A, then the subscript, the um, uh, underscore key, and capital S, and that will now be lambda s. I'll just drag that a bit so you can see it. There's the expression. Now, I want to edit that, so let's give that a value of, say, 10. So if the unemployment rate is 1% above the zero rate, then wages will rise by 10%. Make it into a parameter as well. Now, this is where the current version's got all sorts of bugs. It's, it's a nuisance, and the, the refactored version will get rid of them. I want to make that into a slider. And the slider means I can change the value and see what happens when I change the value. And I also want to put that somewhere else on the screen because what I tend to do is I'll whack all the controls up in the top left hand corner so you can reach them. So you can take a copy of that, right click and choose copy. Drag it over here, you've now got a copy of that variable. If you now right click and choose slider, you put a slider on top of it. Okay. Now the slider you can see starting from zero not the value that I typed in before, end of 0 0.6. So if you right click again and choose edit, you can change the range. And so it starts at 0 0.6, its maximum is say 0 0.7, saying if 70% of the workers want a wage rise, then wages rise. That's when, you start, when your grandmother starts getting a job. Okay, if 70% of the population had a job, you'd be dragging the grandparents out to work because the wages are so good. So. That's a reasonable range. Equally, if, if say 50% of the workforce doesn't have a job, then you've got a serious recession on your hands. Okay. So that's a reasonable range. And I'll give a step size of 0 0.1, 0 0.01, pardon me, which is a 1% change each time I press the sideways arrow key. So I do that, and now I've got this variable, I'll just make it again larger, so you can see it, 0 0.6. And each press of the sideways key changes that by 0.01. <coughs> if I hold down the 
uh, control key and press it, it changes by a larger margin. So you can change that during the simulation and see what the effect is. Let's just move that back over now. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll drag it right over here a bit. This, the palette size, in terms of if you actually wanted to build the biggest model you can and you had the biggest computer screen to look at it, it's 100,000 by 100,000 pixels. Now, the biggest screens you can currently buy are 4,000 by 2,000. So the vision is we want FBI to have a, ultimately have a wraparound room where the whole, you know, people are sitting in the middle managing an economy and the entire economy model is visually around them. There are control rooms like that being built in some university, I believe there's one in Amsterdam and one in um, Berlin as well, I think. So the high-scale computer simulation models and Minsky is being designed so it can be built into one of those. But we haven't got there yet. So what I've now got, I've got the employment rate minus an area. I want to multiply that by the slope, so I press the multiply key. And if you then drag to the top here, I'm now saying multiply the gap between the employment rate and the Nehru, and that gives you how much wages are going to change. So I can just call this, let's call this Phillips. Again, I'll shift this thing sideways. So PHIL underscore, and I'll call it curve. That's my Phillips curve. And now it's when you start getting into integration blocks because that's the rate of change, that's the function for rate of change of wages given an employment rate. Well, I now need to have the rate of change of wages. And what, again, was, as I mentioned, all these programs use integration rather than differentiation. So what I now have is an integral block, and there's two ways to get the integral block. I'll show you the conventional way. Notice up here in the palette, I haven't been through the palette in detail. Let's go through that. So you have a godly table. That's the unique thing that no other program has. Variable, constant, integral block. Then plus key, minus, multiply, divide, log, uh, power, less than, less than or equal to. Oh, by the way, there's no greater than or greater, or greater than or, or greater than or equal to. Guess why? Minsky, uh, Russell's a mathematician. He said, if you've got a less than key, you can set it up so your equation is the same as having greater than. Just change it around. He wouldn't put them in there. Uh, minimum, maximum, uh, and a logical or, logical and, um, a negation key, time, which you do occasionally use, a differential block, so you can to put differentiation in there. Again, one thing which is different about Minsky, um, the reason that they, programs don't use differentiation directly is that it's a very uneven process. But what Russell's written here is an actual symbolic differential engine. So it's not doing numerical differentiation, which is inaccurate because you've got to approximate fitting a curve with a tangent or with a, a step function between points on a curve. This is actually logical differentiation. So it'll be precisely accurate. And then all the others. So that's in data input, and I'll show you how it's used in the Portuguese model, square root, exponential, log, sines, cosines, etc., etc. Uh, and then this is a very useful key, that's a logical case statement. So for example, you might want to have set the interest rate and have a control on the interest rate so it can't fall below zero. So you use a case statement to do that. The chart I've shown you, and that's just a text, a text entry, so you type text on the screen. And most of these, there's a keyboard shortcut. Okay. And they tend to make sense. So um, what I'll do, what, what do you think would be a sensible key to use for an integral sign on the keyboard? S. Huh? S. S is a possibility, that's true, but S is a character you're going to type all the time. What key looks like an integration key? Integration key's got a curly shape to it, hasn't it? The ampersand. So if you type an ampersand key, you get the integral block. Let's give it a try. So, which is above the seven on my keyboard. So that creates an integral block, and it gives the default name of I and T one. If you right-click and choose Edit, let's just know that make that W for wage. Or we'll call it wage. Wage underscore curly brackets rate. So being extremely verbal about this, give it initial value of one. Oops. Not wage plus rate, I typed the wrong key. So I'll just go back inside there and delete the plus key and make it a 
sub, a, a, a underscore key, and I get wage rate. So now what I want to do is have the basic differential equation that applies for um, integration. And this is a, what you're talking about with the Phillips curve, you're saying the percentage rate of change of wages is a function of the employment rate. Okay. Well, the percentage rate of change of anything is 1 over anything, the anything dt. Okay, so 1 over w, the w dt is equal to the Phillips curve. So what I want to have is making it into operation, dw dt equals the wage rate times the Phillips curve. And then I integrate. So I'm then saying the integral of the wage rate is equal to the wage rate times the Phillips curve. So I want to now multiply by the wage rate here. And here's another trick in Minsky. If I right click here, you get the right click menu, of course. But notice it says copy or copy variable. And what you want to do here is copy not the entire integration block, but just the variable itself. So if I choose copy var, I get a copy of wage rate. I can place it here and type a multiply key and wire that up. So the Phillips curve multiplied by the wage rate integrated is the wage rate. And if you look on the equations tab now, we've now defined a Phillips curve expression. Rate of change of wages is the Phillips curve times current wages. And if you divide through, divide both sides by the wage rate, you get the percentage rate of change of wages is the Phillips curve. Okay. And the Phillips curve is defined as the slope of the reaction function of workers multiplied by the gap between the current employment rate and the neighbor. Okay, So all quite easy to understand. So at that level, I've now defined enough to define the entire system. And I'll take you out of it so I can show the logic again. So let's drag this over here. Make it a bit smaller again. But you can see it's getting a bit large for the screen already. So I've got GD, I've got G, wage rate here. If I multiply the wage rate by workers, I've got the wage bill. So if I right click on workers and choose copy, <coughs> drag it up here and type a multiply key and drag that down, I'll be able to find a wage bill. Okay? Now, I'm going to write wage bill down here. And attach from one to the other. The reason I've done that is I want to have a loop. So to get a loop, if I right click on any of these objects and choose flip, turns it around. And then notice the line's got a dot on it. Click the dot and you can drag and make it into a circle. And once you've done that a bit, you get more dots turning up and you can make it more curved. Now, if you get really crazy and you end up doing something like this, okay. holy shit, right, get, go back to the dots that are turning up. Either point at, one of the line, point at the line or point at one of the dots. Right click and you get the option straighten. As long as you can actually get a creeping on there. Ah. This, every time I click on this track code, it moves the down. It says straighten. Okay, so straighten, get rid of that stuff. And then I can go back and just make a couple. You can also delete. Once you're once you highlighted and the blue dots turn up, just press the delete key. Delete the wire as well. Okay, so let's go back and... Okay, now I've got the wage bill, and over here I've got GDP. If I take a copy of GDP, then GDP minus wages in this simple model with no bankers equals profit. So if I now drag this down, I've now got profit. And for the sake of it, I'm going to use the Greek letter pi. That's pi for profits. And for the, now with the simple Goodwin model, all profits are invested. 
So I now type, let's go, I'm going to I underscore G for gross investment. Attach that up here. Investment's the way to change a capital stock. So I now want to have a, a capital stock integral block there. Type the ampersand. Either double click or um, right click. And say there's 300 units of capital. I'm ignoring depreciation here, but I'll bring that in in a moment. So gross investment integrated becomes the capital stock. If I now divide that by the capital, I'm going to be uh, mucky here, so lowercase or subscript output, uppercase ratio. Ah, and there's a mistake I made. I, I tried to type the um, Upper, the uppercase, and I, I press the um, um, in Minsky at the moment, the current version, you type the power key by accident, so let's delete that. I'll check out to find that. And rest the ratio is not actually superscripted, it's gone back to the same level as capital. So I put the, if I put the caret key in there, that's superscripts ratio. Now let's give that a value of 3. And then if you divide the stock of capital by the capital out ratio, you get GDP. Whoops. And drag that right, hang on. Now there's your basic model. I'm not sure they've got the numbers right to make it actually work sensibly. But if I now bring a plot key down, so click on a plot, pop it down here and click again to fix it. Let's just take the employment rate as what we're charting. It'd be really messy to have the word employment rate there, so I'm going to take a copy of employment rate. Ah, I flipped it by accident, pardon me. Take a copy of the employment rate, whack it up here, flip it around again. And I'm going to give that the definition of lambda. So if I type L-A-M-B-D-A, I get the Greek lambda key. And by dragging one to the other, I should find employment. Lambda is the employment rate. And I can also, for example, find the wage, the wage bill. Take a copy of that. And divide the wage bill by GDP. Then we've got the wage share, and the term I use for that is omega. So let's now graph those two. So take a copy of lambda. And notice these little inputs on the side of the chart. That will now graph lambda against time, the employment rate. Take a copy of this one. I'll whack it on the same graph. That will now graph omega as a share and if I want to see an XY plot then I simply attach the same two things to the same colour markers on the sheet so black to black in this case Hit the stop key and hit run and see what happens. And you get a cyclical economy. Okay? Mm -hmm. Another simple thing, this is one of the crazy things that you wonder why people haven't done this other programs. But notice there's a little, you can see on the circle one there, you can see the dot. Okay? No other program has that. It's ridiculous to me that it does because you, you get these plots and you can't see what's happening. But uh, if this is running, as you can see, you can see exactly where you're up to on that cycle. So let's just pause that. Uh, I'll show you some more tricks as well. Notice that the charts, well, first of all, it's hard to see that chart, so let's just make it a bit larger. Drag it over a bit. Click on there, one option you get is resize. You get a rubber band. So you can make it larger. 
And notice there are angled ones on the side here, as well as the straight ones, there are angled ones, and there's ones on both sides. So these are designed to be XY plots, and double axis XY plots. If you don't put anything on the bottom axis, it's graphed against time. If you do put something on the bottom axis, then if they're matching black to black, red to red, etc., etc., you graph them as XY plots on the one chart. And if you really want to be silly, you can have eight on one, plot, one chart because there's eight inputs to each of the charts. Uh, we didn't go eight too many, but it's just to make that possibility sit there anyway. So what I want to do is show this for a time range. So I can bring down a letter T. That's time. I'll flip that around, so right click and choose flip that. And then I attach T to the angle input on this chart, and T minus, say, 10 to give 10 years view. Type a constant of 10. And have T minus 10 over here, so I'll take a copy of T. Type a minus key. T minus 10. Attach that to the whoops. Again, that's the point about clicking on the right part of the icon to that particular bit. Stop it and start it again. And now I get a rolling 10 year display of the amount of data there. There's only one other program that supports that. That's VizSim. And they support it because I suggested it. So I reckon I didn't steal that when they, I gave it to them instead. So that's that's the basic dynamic model. Let's just save that before I, uh, I have it. Oh, if anything crashes, by the way, if you have a divide by zero and that sort of mistake, if it crashes, the program goes cold. If you type the alt space bar, you get the Windows level menu for shutting an application down or changing the size, maximize, minimize. If you choose close, I don't, I won't, I'll do it now, but I, I won't actually go any further. That means I would lose it. But if that happens, if the program freezes on you, do that and the control comes back. And you can fix up your mistake. And that's necessary because there are so many bugs. Okay. But anyway, let's, I'll just save it now. So is that okay? Is it demo of how to use the program? Okay. Now let's just create a new one. So I go to File and New. I want to show you how to use the Godly table. Okay. Now that's that's the, the innovation that Minsky has that other programs don't have. So click on the bank icon. You then get a bank object like this. Click somewhere on the canvas and it's placed there. For the heck of it, I'm going to put three tables on screen. Just to emphasise, you can have more than one and show you how they're working. Now, what they implement is double entry bookkeeping, but I didn't understand double entry bookkeeping when I started building in Minsky. I had single entry tables initially. The reason I developed it was because I built these models of money creation and money flows and so on using differential equations, and I tried to put them in I could simulate them in MathCAD, which is my favourite mathematics program, but I just got a static graph. So I wanted to have dynamic stuff and show it to people. And I tried rapidly to build them in VizSim, and I would always make a mistake. Because if you have like, wages are being paid, the money's coming out of the firm's account, going into the worker's account. So I've got to have things subtracted from the work firm's account and added to the worker's, and I'd get the sign wrong. And the program would just explode. And I finally thought, I wonder if I can actually Okay, I was designing and using tables and then writing them up. I said, I wonder if I can make the tables generate the equations. So I did that in MathCAD symbolically, and that gave me the idea that if we took Minsky, we could actually use the differential equations, use tables to generate differential equations. Then once I did it, I began to learn the importance of double entry bookkeeping. So the program itself, if you right click on one of these bank icons and choose open the godly table, you get this sort of thing. And notice there's a little checkbox for double entry, which is checked by default. We're going to, I'm paying for this myself. Uh, we've run out of money for developing it, so I'm paying whatever it'll take, Russell, to redesign it so these tables automatically have 
assets, liabilities, and equity. Okay? But at the moment, you've got to click on this no asset pass button to say whether something is an asset, a liability, or equity. That's definitely a liability. <laughs> They're going to keep on happening or what? Let's hope not, otherwise it ruins the talk here. So click on asset pass. I'll do this quickly in case it's going to become a feature. So you choose asset, uh, pardon me, choose asset, and I'll just type um, L-O-A-N-S underscore F for loans to the firm sector. And this also says have loans to the household sector, so L-O-A-N-S underscore curly bracket H-H, close curly bracket. Loans households. That's two types of assets. Notice what's happening on the screen now. Those assets are turning up at the bottom of the, of the godly table. So I've typed loans underscore F, loans underscore household, in these columns, and they've both turned up here. And notice, I didn't actually mention that properly, I'm clicking on the plus key. Each time I click on the plus key, it creates a new column and moves the other one sideways. And I've still, the next, it defaults, to, if you created an asset, it defaults to creating an asset. In the next version, there'll be three separate sets of columns. Assets, liabilities, equity. Click on the plus key in each of them, you add an extra element of an asset or a liability or an equity, you've got to do it manually. So I'm going to choose this and say liability. Okay. <coughs> so firms, uh, then one more for work. For, I'll, I'll, call, I'll call it HH for households. Well, how this call it households? <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> and then the final thing here, you've got to have the equity for the bank. So I'll call that, I'm going to define that as bank, B-A-N-K. So, thank you. Okay. Now, that's what we've got here. So loans, the firm sector, loans to households, firms, households, and bank. Now, the secret of double entry, double entry bookkeeping, for those who haven't learned it through accounting or through doing modern monetary theory, is that... The fundamental law of accounting is assets minus liabilities equals equity. That's the little guide that accountants use to make sure they record transactions properly. Um, what we do in Minsky is we define assets to be positive, liabilities to be negative, which makes sense, and equity also be negative, which doesn't make sense, but it's a convention. And the idea of the convention is if, you, if, you, if assets are positive, and liabilities and equity are both shown as negative, then every row must sum to zero. If it doesn't, you make an accounting error. And that includes your initial condition. So let's imagine the initial loans to the firm sector is, say, 100. No loans to the households. I'll leave that out for the moment. And this says $80, $80 in the firm's account, say, 15 in the bank's account. Notice what Minsky is doing. It's checking up and seeing what your sum is so far. So 10 minus 80 minus 15 is 5. You've got to make sure the row sum is 0. So it's up a minus 5 there. And now the row sum is correct. So that's doing a numerical check. But of course, when you add actual financial operations, Minsky does a symbolic check to make sure the symbolic terms add to 0. So now, what you have, having had initial conditions, what you now need to add over here or operations. So click on the plus key and you create an additional row. And then you can label what the operation is here. The label has no impact at the moment logically, it's just for your own information. But I'd say for example borrow borrow money. Then if I type L E N D underscore F here, so that's a loan increases the assets for the banking sector. Of course, the money then goes into the firm's account. So I now type minus lend here. That's increasing the liability for the banks. Okay, which might make sense to show it as a negative. So I'm going to have minus lend here. Underscore F, and Minsky makes sure that that get checks here. That sums to zero. Let's say now the next thing is pay interest. Let's say repay, repay loan. Then I'm going to have a positive repay here because adding a positive amount to a negative reduces its magnitude. 
Okay. That's the intuitive sense of the thing there. And now I want to type minus repay because that's going to reduce the uh, the amount there. And I've made a deliberate error. I can make them accidentally. This is doing it deliberately. So because I typed, I typed underscore f there and dash f over here, and Minsky says you've got, that's the sum of what you've got, it's not zero. So you need to edit that particular row to replace the, the dash with an underscore. And the way you do that is click in the cell and hold the control key down. And then you move a character at a time inside that window. And you can actually get to the dash key, backspace, and type the underscore and then you've got the correct level, okay? We might make that easier, but that's slightly, I don't know how intuitive that is, but it's, if you type the arrow key here at the moment, you move sideways. To move inside a cell, you hold the control key, and then you move inside the cell, and you can type wherever you might want to inside the cell. That's repay. Let's say pay interest. Then the interest payment is gonna come from the firm sector, and the basic story about most FROMs are going to be positive. A flow from somewhere to somewhere else. So plus the interest, and that's going to increase the bank's equity, minus cent. Okay. Then you hire wage workers. For the hire workers, you've got to pay wages. And they go to the households. Okay. And then you, uh, the workers consume. So I'll say CONS underscore W for workers. And that, of course, the consumption goes to the, to the firm sector. And then the bankers consume as well. I can make that more complicated, but I also put consumption there to make it easy for fast entries. That also goes to the firm sector. I have, whoops, I noticed I made another. That was an, actually, that was an unintentional error. So I've got to now type the backspace key and type capital B. And now that's correct. So what I've ended up defining out of that, you can see the bank icon now has the flows being shown on the left-hand side and the stocks being shown on the right-hand side and on the bottom. And if you check the equations, you can now find a set of differential equations. Now, which is, which is easier? Okay. No, no contest. So I know that I'm not gonna make a mistake in defining the differential equations. And that's the beauty of, of using the tabular approach to do it. Now, having done that, that's looking uh, at the whole system from the point of view of the banking sector. So, remember it says, it says godly O up here. That's just a default text string to label the table. I now call that bank sec banking sector. I now label that particular godly table is the banking sector's view, but I've also got firms inside here in households. So if I go, whoops, pardon me, error somehow, ring up this table, open that godly table, let's call it the uh, firms, and I want to see, I want the firms are going to have assets, liabilities, and equity. Again, I've got to do this manually each time, which is a pain we're going to get rid of with the next version. Click on asset, and notice there's a little arrow key here a little down arrow. What that's there for is you click on that, the program searches to find any liabilities that haven't yet been allocated as an asset to somebody else in the system. So if I click on this and choose firms, Minsky brings across all the operations that are currently stored. For some reason, the consumption level hasn't been shown for work, so I'll fix that up to pay interest, borrow money, repay. It's all shown over here, but notice the row sums are all wrong because it's bringing across the existing operation. You've got to show where it goes to. Um, so click again, choose liability, and does the firm sector have any liabilities? Well, yes, it does. It's borrowed money from the, from the um, bank. So if I click on, now click on loans F there, Minsky will check out and put the relevant operations next to lend and repay. So notice those two operations now sum to zero. And that's 
the logic the advantage of doing this with Minsky rather than doing it by hand. It covers all that stuff for you. You simply have to fill in the missing bits. And the missing bits apply to the equity of the firm sector. So I'll call this E underscore firms. Put it in curly brackets as well. Um, there are some little hassles in how things are checked. That's why I'm, I didn't type firms again, because notice I've got firms over here as the bank account. I should have shown a firm underscore D for deposits. Okay. If I type firms over here, means you would track it and say you're making an error. So that's why I'm cheating by putting a D there instead. But obviously, anything consumption by bankers and workers increases your equity, and paying wages and interest decreases your equity. So I now put the opposite sign operations over here. And again, that's why you've got the convention, because even though your equity is really positive, the convention makes sure you get the signs right. So I type minus consumption for bankers there. That row is now correct. Minus consumption for workers there. That row is correct. Positive interest. That row is now correct. And positive wages. Those are all correct. And notice the equity of the firm sector is negative. Okay. In fact, to show it as negative, we've got to type it in as positive. Now, this is one little insight that doing this stuff does on the economic <coughs> scale. Of the, doing, this, doing this accounting on the scale of an economy points out a few logical issues that weren't clear to me until I designed Minsky. And that is that, first of all, banks have to have positive equity. A bank with negative equity is bankrupt. Like, that's why they fold. When they, that's why you have the Lerman Brothers crash. I think, I think it was, um, what's his name, Hank Paulson was rung up by the boss of Lerman saying, we're going bankrupt. We need support, we need it now. And Paulson said, well, how long do you reckon you got before you go bankrupt? And the boss of Lerman said, about three hours. Okay. What was happening is the value of their assets were plunging because the value of the assets included the price of the assets. And people were writing down their value on the markets. Assets were plunging. Liabilities remaining constant, it had to hit equity. Okay. So that's one thing. But the banks had to have positive equity. Because assets minus liabilities equals equity for everybody in the economy, and one person's asset is another person's liability, the sum of all equity is zero. That's financial equity. Obviously, we've got physical objects we all own, okay? But if you sum up the financial value of everything in an economy, you get zero. Well, that means that banks are operating with positive equity. In the aggregate, the rest of the economy is operating with negative equity. Okay? Now, households and firms can cope with negative equity because they're earning wages and profits. But banks have to have positive. And that, to me, is one massive reason why you should have a government sector because the government sector can handle negative equity. The central bank can have negative equity. The government can have negative equity because we still accept its notes as payment. If you, then the government can therefore run a deficit, inverted commas. What that really means is spending more than it gets back in taxation. And by providing that, it means the rest of us who are trying to get positive equity can actually do it. Without a government, net equity is zero. And therefore, the equity of the non-bank financial sector is negative. So that's a little ideological reason I can even use to convince arch reactionaries that there should be a government sector, because they all arch reactionaries like saving money. I'm saying, well, in the aggregate, you can't do it unless you have a government. Do you want a government? Do you want a government? Anyway, what we've now defined, let's just let's finish this for the workers down here now. So I'll label this as workers or households and do the same sort of story. Choose asset, click in the arrow what's not allocated, only households here at the moment. They've got consumption and wages but no liability, so I can ignore the liabilities for the moment, just type their equity and say this household underscore lowercase e, I'll type equity out, equity. And then I've got to have the opposite sign here, so consumption by work, workers reduces equity and wages increase equity and their equity, they've got a positive equity, so I type minus 15 inside there. And now I've got a completely balanced model of the financial sector, a financial model of a very simple economy. We take a look at the equations we're defined, that's a set of differential equations that have been defined. And notice the differential equations change the sign. So the reason for using the convention is just to make sure you don't make errors. 
but the differential equations themselves, all the elements in there default to being positive. Okay? So deposits are shown as positive, loans are shown as positive, etc., etc. It's just the convention makes sure we don't make mathematical errors in defining these equations. So, for example, the rate of change in the amount of money in the firm's account is loans by firms, which increase the amount of money in the account, plus consumption by workers and bankers, minus repayment of debt, minus interest, minus wages. Okay. And if you want to document this, then you go here and choose output latex. I'm not, sure, I'm not sure whether it gives the default subscript of TEX, but if I now go over and check that, um, that entry, I've now got all the commands that are necessary to format that in a LaTeX program. And if you bring up, say, math type, who uses math type in Word? Okay, it's um, not very good, but it's better than nothing. So if I, for example, want to document this in a Word, Word document, then it's slightly mucky to go about it. A, a straight latex word processor would take all that's in in one go. But if I do this, and take a copy of it and then paste it there, then I can document that in an academic paper. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's the basics. Now the next thing I need to show you, I'm gonna save this because, well, I'll show you what we've got to do at the moment. I want to make a copy of LEND. I want to define lending. I oh, so this is to find the interest rate, interest payments, which are obviously the rate of interest times existing loans. Okay? So if you right click, you can choose interest, make a copy, place it down here. Right click on loans, make a copy, bring it down here. Uh, what I'm defining is the interest payments, or the rate of interest on loans, I'll call it R underscore L, Oh, let's resize that a bit. And I must have forgotten that I didn't type the L. Okay. Here they just say a value of 5%. Multiply the two together. And then I've defined interest payments. Okay. And at the moment I've got enough in there to actually show that. So if I whack a graph there and decide to graph it. Then I get a value of five because the outstanding loans are 100 at the moment, okay? So what you're setting up is a, is a dynamic model. You can actually model the financial flows in an economy and you can also link them to the real economy. So you might want to have, you know, how many, okay, that's the wage bill you're paying. How many workers does that mean you've hired? We then would take a variable for wages, divide that by the wage rate, and then get the number of workers you've hired, all go in the opposite direction, have a causal loop for it, etc., etc. So that's the basics. Um, just to show you one thing, I'll say, I'll say, I'll save this. Okay, make this godly demo. At the moment we don't have 100% compatibility between the beta version and the release. Just one of those things, we're working towards it. But if I now load this with Minsky, the Minsky beta program, Notice now, actually, I'm going to type one of those operators by accident. Okay. Notice a few changes. First of all, all the values are turning up. Notice interest sharing at this five there. Okay. So all the values turn up there. But what I wanted to do was make it easier to grab all the, um, rather than do it each time for each variable, it just takes too damn long. But you can now copy all the flow variables or all the stock variables in one motion, so let's give that a try. 
copy the stock variables first of all. You get a group. I haven't shown you groups yet. I can zoom in and see the group. This is another trick, again, the other programs don't have. As I zoom up, again, it's not working all the ah, Hang on. Other way. It's not working all that well, but you can actually see what's inside the groups there. So let's just, um, um, I'll zoom back out again. Okay. But you can also choose right click and choose ungroup. Wait a while. Hang on. Oh, there we go. Okay. So now I've copied all three that were on that particular object. Uh, and this is again a bug. Okay, I can select it, select it, select it. And I can do the same for all, all the stock, all the flow variables. So copy flow variables takes a while because it's a beta. There's all sorts of error checking code going in the background. Place it over here, right click and choose ungroup, wait. A wire. And there they are. So now I can, for example, define um, consumption by workers as based on the amount of money that's in workers. Let's just copy those ones as well. Copy the flip stock variables here. Right click, ungroup. Hmm. Okay. And now drag oops, drag households over here. And I could now define consumption by households as based on the amount of money in their bank accounts or their wages. That sort of thing is all possible. So if you do that how can you get the group variables? Pardon? How can you get the group okay. copy the group variables? Okay, if you if in the whole table right click on a godly table. Or you you you're you're using the development version. The release, not the, it's, this isn't the beta. So you want, in, the, in the current version, you've got to right click on each of the objects. So for example, if I wanted to define weight, um, define consumption by workers, I'd right click on consumption by workers, choose copy, okay? okay? Yeah. And then I choose households, choose copy. And what I tend to do, and this is using something from system dynamics, I could multiply the value of the housing bank account by some factor to say how often banks turn over the money each year. But what system engineers have developed at the idea of what they call a time constant. Now, it doesn't have to be a constant, but the idea you divide something by a time constant, and the time constant tells you how much of the time unit it takes for something to happen. So let's say, for example, I said households turn over the money in their account six times a year. Okay. Well, the time constant for that is two months. So if I divide the household balance, bank balance by one sixth, I get exactly the same as multiplying it by six. What that's telling me is households turn over their accounts every two months, which is saying how long can households survive before they run out of money? Two months. Now what if the answer is two weeks? You change the factor to one over 26. So time constants make more sense than multiplying by actual constants because the constants themselves, people wonder why, why have you got a, a big number there? Why do I have 26 for households and one for work for bankers? What it's saying is households can survive two weeks before they run out of money, bankers can survive a year before they run out of money. So working in terms of time constants make more sense. So I'll just do that and I tend to use the letter tau, the Greek letter tau. So now I would have divide by, divide households by the time constant for households, and that'll give you the value for consumption by workers. And if I give that a value, let's, let's make that a value of say 0.02, which is one week. That's saying households can go a week before they run out of money. And that then gives you the definition for the amount of consumption being done by households. Okay. Now that is what lies behind this monster. Okay. So what I've shown you is toy level stuff, but that's all you can really cover in an introductory tutorial. But it does scale to the stage of modelling the whole Portuguese economy. As it happens, this model is more accurate in predicting the Portuguese economy than the model of the Portuguese Central Bank or Treasury, mm -hmm. done by a master's student. 
think he's now doing a PhD with me. Um, so I'll just finish up with the, with the other points there. Um, one thing most of the other programs can't do is this on-screen live simulation, which I've shown you an example of seeing the graphs actually charge. In Simulink and in, in Simulink you can bring up a scope and see it, but the scope is not visible on the diagram. And in Vensim, you can bring up graphs, but you only see the final output, you don't see the time changes. And to me, it makes much more sense to see what's changing through time, which is what VizSim does. And you can all the parameters as you go. So let's just actually go back to that model of, um, hang on, which one have I got? I'm gonna save that one, let's go over here. Okay. If I simulate this, I can change the value for, ah, you can see it having an impact there. Change the value for the worker's reaction to employment and change the outcome as the model's running live. Again, that's only possible in VizSim. And you can export to LaTeX also to MATLAB, so if you want to build a complicated model but you want to do more mathematics than you can within Minsky, you can just whack it across to MATLAB and use MATLAB's powers there for analysing it. Uh, I've shown you the basic idea of godly tables and interlocking tables and multiple tables. Um, I've also mentioned bugs. If you lock up the alt space bar plus close, we'll fix up the problem. You can restart the program. But please, if you do get involved, join the beta program and give feedback to Russell because we have an active, if you list a problem, Russell's quite methodical about going through and seeing if you can reproduce what you find, send in the file, send him a screenshot, and then you can use that to see where the problem is and fix the problem up. Um, now, as I mentioned, I thought it couldn't scale the country scale stuff until Pedro sent me his model of Portugal and a Czech guy sent me his model of Poland. Okay, so I've got to get hold of um, Tulinski again on that front, but I can give you a model of the Polish economy. Uh, done in Minsky. And what I want to do is, at the moment, just effectively making a model of a single a scale of GDP, just a single scale of number over time, I want to make it multi-sectoral. And I've done that by hand, um, but it's a huge amount of work. So what I want to have with Minsky is build a single model, like a scale model, and then just choose multi-sector. Tell it how many sectors you want, it will build the differential equations for you. And they'll be vector differential equations, not just scalar differential equations. And equally, clone a single economy. So make a model of a single economy, clone it, and then you've got a multiple economy world with financial flows between countries, capital flows, goods flows, labour flows. All the code for the differential equations all generated automatically. It's then your job just to build the parameters. I say just, okay? but you could actually derive that from data as well. So this is the long-term objective. And I want to also allow direct entry of equations to get away from this clutter effect, which just makes it unreadable. That, that's probably the next major task after we get the godly table fixed up, is fixing up the clutter problem. Uh, but of course, development costs money, so you could support me through Patreon for that, which I'm doing right now. But I actually suggested with Russell this morning, we might actually set up a separate Patreon page for, for Minsky, and Patreon lets you put as little as a dollar a month in. They add VAT on top of that, uh, so you, like a dollar will cost you about a dollar twenty. But if you do find yourself using it, we, we don't charge for it, but if you provide the money, we can improve it over time. So I'd really appreciate once we get that going, people doing that. My voice is about to die. Any questions? There is a Linux version that is working. Oh, it's it's all open source and multi-platform. So if you go to um, the download uh, yeah. under browse or files, okay. Okay. you get Mac binaries and source code, and under source code you get tar files, which uh, we've actually built packages for Debian, I think. Debian. Debian, I think so. Yeah. So you can actually get a pre like a pre-compiled version of that for you. Okay. That's exist already or you're already exist. Um, I think I think there are packages for Debian already. So what Russell set up is once he saves the code for a new version, then that becomes a package. And if you've installed Minsky on your Linux box, 
then the package update process will automatically update it for you. Is there a written guidebook for, for this? Uh, pretty bad. <laughs> um, there is a help file. Let's just take a look at that. So press F1, of course. Tick, tick, tick. Oh, dear. Yeah. Hang on, let's go. That should have worked. I'll try again. Help. Oh. <coughs> I don't know why it's not downloading. But that's a built in help system which covers most of the basics. Uh, there's also a. Here we go, finally. There we go. Pretty basic stuff. So it tells you. Let's get rid of that silly thing there. Talks about how Minsky is, what system dynamics is, how it's like other programs, how it differs, a basic tutorial, the basic operators, and so on. But ba largely, it's just a case of suck it and see. And you saw how easy it was to define a dynamic model there. Um, just try it where you get stuck, check the help file. If you get completely stuck, drop me an email, or Hyman, or, uh, or Russell and we'll take it from there. Uh, that's a basic whole file, and we've saved, we've got that as a PDF file as well. I'm not sure if I can find the PDF, but that, we are gonna bundle that with the program, so the PDF is slightly more detailed on how to actually drive the program. Okay.